Today, we are fortunate to have with us one of the leading experts on the biology of politics, uh, Professor John Hibbing. He's the Foundation Regents uh, University Professor of Political Science in the, uh, in the Political Science Department at the University of Nebraska at Lincoln. He's a co-author of a book, Predisposed, Liberal, Conservative, and the Biology of Political Difference. John has been a NATO Fellow in Science, a Senior Fulbright Fellow, a Guggenheim Fellow, a recipient of the Fennel Prize, principal investigator for nine National Science Foundation grants, and has also been elected to the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences. His current research focuses on the effects of cortisol levels on voter turnout. So we'll be talking <laughs> today about the differences, uh, the biological and physiological differences between liberals and conservatives. Join me now in welcoming. Well, thank you very much for that kind introduction, and thank you for having me out. It's always nice to start off with some connections. I actually don't have a lot of connections to uh, Eastern Washington. Um, I do have a connection to your current dean, Matt Jockers, who uh, we miss greatly. He used to be at Nebraska. Uh, although when I miss him too much, I can actually interact with his son, who is a student, uh, and uh, a lot smarter than his dad. <laughs> um, so there's that. Uh, before I became interested in this kind of weird biology and psychology and politics, I was a more traditional student of, of Congress. So the first half of my career, first 20 years really, I was um, working on Congress congressional careers and public opinion toward Congress. And um, at that time, um, Tom Foley was a big name. And uh, you know, it was, it was a good time to study Congress. And I'm sure you've heard this a million times before, but I certainly wish we had more uh, people like Tom Foley in Congress today. That would, uh, would really be an advantage. So um, we missed that. The only other connection I have to Eastern Washington, I wrestled with whether or not to tell this story, but I spent a semester as a student uh, when I was an undergraduate at Billings, Montana, a place called Rocky Mountain College. Didn't really stick, but uh, I had a, a good friend who had a girlfriend in a small town uh, right across the border from Idaho into uh, Eastern Washington. I, I'm going to have to try to look up what town it was. And all I knew, he wanted me to come with him to meet his girlfriend one weekend, so we had the plans, we drove, it's quite a long drive. Got there, and his the parents of his girlfriend met us at the door with not smiling faces. <laughs> uh, apparently, there had been some communication between my friend and his girlfriend that was intercepted by the parents <laughs> and suggested a degree of intimacy in the relationship that uh, they were not comfortable with. So uh, we didn't have any money. We were out on our ear, and uh, we ended up sleeping in the back of his car. And, and then we woke up at 5 in the morning with this big kind of mountain man-like guy knocking on our window. He didn't like us staying in, in his field road. I'm happy to say that my reception in eastern Washington this time was much, much better. People have been very friendly and I'm glad to be here on Washington State campus. So that's, that's it. That's my, my connection. So um, I spent a fair bit of time in the Seattle airport last night waiting for my collection, connecting flight. And I read a piece by a guy named Jonathan Rauch, a, a journalist who I really quite like. But I'm going to pick on the particular piece that I read last night. It was one of these articles that makes a big deal out of the fact that uh, we've got tribes in the United States right now, political tribes. And it's easily, to, easily understandable because of all the uh, opportunities we have to follow the certain you know, type of, of media outlets that are consistent with our beliefs. Uh, and the, the, the impression at the end of the article is really that we kind of flip a coin and decide whether to be liberal or conservative. And then once we're, we make that declaration, then all these other things kick into gear. We've got our silos, we've got our interaction, and all that's, that's very understandable. But I think what, what Rauch and almost everybody else does is they kind of skip over the fact. I don't think it's a coin flip whether we're liberal or conservative. And that's really what I'd like to figure out. What's going on? Why do we have this inclination? You know, I really don't think people are conservative because they watch Fox News. Uh, they watch Fox News because they're conservative, and same with MSNBC on, on the liberal side. So there's a lot of reinforcement there that's a very important thing, but there is something deeper that I'd like to get at. So that's what I'm going to talk to you about, especially in the first half of my talk, the first two-thirds. The last third, I'm going to shift gears just a little bit, and as you can see in the parenthetical up here, uh, talk about something that I'm working on right now, which is not the difference between liberals and conservatives, but what's different about uh, specifically strong supporters of Donald Trump and other people in the political environment. I think it might be a little more timely and, and a little more focused, but more on that in, in just a second. So um, I'm going to try to convince you that there are these deep psychological and perhaps physiological differences between liberals and conservatives. And I'm going to do that with uh, a variety of, of uh, tasks that we've subjected our, our participants to. 
Uh, the first one is called the face in the crowd paradigm, as you can see, and you can kind of play around with this. What's going to happen is on the next screen you'll see um, a whole bunch of faces. It's actually the same person's face, and it happens to be a female in the example I provided for you, and she has the same expression in all of these pictures except one. So one of the images that you see on the screen has a different uh, expression than the other. It's called the oddball expression. And if you were really a research participant of mine, you'd be sitting at a computer and you'd hit the space bar as soon as you spotted that face in the crowd that was different, the oddball expression. So you're not sitting in front of a space bar, but you could maybe just uh, raise your hand if you, if you see the face that's different than the others. And then I'll explain uh, what's going on in, in just a second. So yeah, some of you are not going to have much luck here. But... <laughs> Good. It's coming up. I see some hands. There it is. Okay. So yeah, it takes us some of us longer than others. I see kind of toward the lower left there. It's got an angry expression, whereas uh, the others are all neutral. Let's do this one more time. So I'll do the same thing. Raise your hand when you see the eyeball expression. Getting the hang of it now. So yeah, this time up here on the right, she's got a different expression. This one's very happy. All right, well, why do we have people do this? Well, there's a very well-established finding in psychology, and that is that people tend to be faster to spot the oddball expression when it's angry than when it's happy. That's why I presented this picture as, as larger. Um, so by the way, we do this many times with many different expressions. Sometimes it's black people, sometimes it's white, sometimes it's old, sometimes it's young, male, female. We do this dozens of times, and then you can average these together and see, uh, you know, you alter the, the uh, order in which the things appear. Calculate all this, and you see that response time is a lot lower when it's an angry expression. <coughs> So we probably wouldn't have to work too hard to come up with an evolutionary explanation for this. It's pretty useful to know uh, who's angry with you. They could do you ill. And it's kind of nice to know who's happy, but it probably doesn't have the same immediacy from an evolutionary point of view. So that's probably why, in general, people do spot the angry expression faster. What's interesting, though, is that there really is a lot of individual variation in this. Some people, uh, you know, it's, it's about the same amount of time. They, they are as quick to spot the happy expression as they are the, the angry expression, but for others, that angry expression just really jumps out of them, and therefore they get that space bar really fast. So that's, that's a puzzle. Why is this? Uh, psychologists have taken a stab at this as well. They can use some demographic things. Maybe older people are more vulnerable. You know, you can come up with all kinds of hypotheses. What about personality traits? Uh, some of you may be familiar with the Big Five personality battery. Uh, maybe people who are neurotic would be more likely to spot the, the angry expression more quickly. Well, it turns out that none of those work. There's basically <laughs> no results across the board. So what my colleagues and I did was uh, we asked people a battery of political questions, like uh, uh, you know, on a scale of one to five, what do you think of, of uh, having more immigration? What about gay marriage? What about the death penalty? <coughs> School prayer, uh, legalizing abortion, uh, legalizing uh, marijuana, reducing spending on social welfare. You get the idea. There were, I think, 18 in this particular battery. Just a, a kind of nice array of social and economic issues. Uh, you can answer from one to five, so you add those together and you get a pretty good range, so you can have a, almost a continuous measure of whether people adopt really liberal positions or on the whole they adopt really conservative positions or somewhere in the middle, so there's, there's a nice range. So you can probably see where we're going with this once we establish this uh, almost continuous measure of political beliefs, we're going to correlate that with uh, people's <coughs> tendency to spot the negative expression more quickly than the happy expression. All right, so here are the first uh, results, um, and this is just for the angry expression. So that first one I showed you where the young lady had, had an angry look, when we show them pictures like that, then it looks like the more conservative people are, the more quickly they hit the space bar. Remember, this is response time, so a lower number would mean you did it faster. So, and it, it might not look like a big difference, but it's really 300 milliseconds, which in this, uh, in this world is, is a fairly big, big change. So conservatives are faster to hit the space bar when they see the angry expression. What about, maybe they're just faster overall. Conservatives might be, might be quicker on the draw. Uh, I don't know. But can we get one battery of lights off here? You think there's a little bit Yeah, might be a little. I don't want to have people in the dark, but uh, might get that contrast a little better. Well, <laughs> I'll get them eventually. There we go. <laughs> Are you guys okay with that? Yeah. 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 All right, yeah, I think that shows up a little better. There we go. Uh, perfect. Thank you, Cornell. So, um, yeah, when it's a happy expression, then it turns out that the conservatives are slower. It goes up higher. So you can do nice statistical things with here, with that, and calculate an anger superiority for conservatives and a smaller, but still statistically significant, happy superiority for, for liberals. So it does look like there's a, a pretty significant relationship between how people respond to angry and happy faces and their political beliefs. And, but, you know, a lot of people always say, well, what about moderates? Remember, they're in the middle. Uh, so this is a, a continuous range. 
the interesting thing about moderates is their the standard deviation goes way up. In other words, it's, uh, mm. they're kind of all over the place. Uh, they, on average, they're in the middle, but the spread is really, uh, really substantial. Well, I hope you found that somewhat interesting because that's what's going to get the next five minutes or so, uh, maybe a little bit longer. Just different uh, paradigms that we've used that basically all come to the same conclusion that there's some differences between liberals and conservatives in these things that aren't really overtly political. There's nothing overtly political about angry and happy faces. What this one is is a, a memory task. So on the left, you see a couple of pictures that are happy uh, for the most part, a beautiful sunset and a jaunty infant. On the right, you see some pictures that are unpleasant, hurricane damage, and a, a malnourished, clearly distraught child. What we did in this paradigm was we had people look at these images one at a time, and there were 120 of them, so these are just samples. And I think we gave them two seconds to look at the, at the images. Then we distracted them for a little bit uh, and brought them back and showed them 240 pictures this time. 120 of them were repeats, 120 of them were new. It's kind of a standard memory paradigm. And what we asked them to do is tell us if you've seen that picture before. So they can get it right, uh, or they might get it wrong. They might say, yeah, I saw that before, when they really didn't, uh, or, or the opposite. So we're interested in whether people are accurate in the kinds of pictures that they remember. Turns out that liberals and conservatives are about equally accurate overall in being able to, to remember the pictures. But when we broke it down by whether they were happy pictures or sad pictures, then we got a very clear pattern. What this white line is represents the difference between remembering negative images and positive images. The higher the line, uh, the more they, they preference the negative. So uh, conservatives are better at remembering those negative images, the ones on the right, the hurricane damage, than they are remembering the beautiful, uh, beautiful sunset, which again we thought was kind of interesting because it's not an overtly political uh, kind of thing. Uh, I suspect many of you have heard of an eye tracker, which is a, a device uh, you can put it on, or they have them these days that you don't even need to, to wear, that they can calibrate from being in front of a computer screen. But they allow us to figure out exactly where somebody's looking. And this can be really useful. In, in the design I'm going to tell you about, we divided the computer screen into quadrants, and then we had a separate image, a different image, in each of the quadrants. We call it a collage, uh, but it really isn't. So, And then what we're curious about is what kind of image people look at. So we can measure what's known as dwell time, which is just how long your eyes are dwelling on this quadrant as opposed to that quadrant. You can actually measure a lot of other stuff too, like um, how many times you go back to the same image or your first fixation time, but dwell time is, is the big one. So I'm gonna show you one of these collages, actually two, uh, and in this age of trigger warnings, I need to say that some of the images are not very pleasant, and unfortunately some of you are eating pizza, so <laughs> you're welcome to look away if you don't wanna see some. Uh, some mildly disgusting, uh, sometimes really disgusting images. So, okay, everybody's fair warned, right? So, uh, here it is. Uh, here you see three pleasant images and one not so pleasant image. Um, these images, by the way, come from something called IAPS. Psychologists have collected a lot of images, thousands of them, and they've been pre-rated, which is kind of nice. So we can say with some confidence that most people kind of like giraffes and angels and chocolate chip cookies, and they don't really like this guy. Uh, <laughs> losing his cookies, I guess, as it were. Um, and here's another example for it. So this one is three positive and one negative. Here's three negative and one positive. People generally like the beach ball, uh, but uh, the, the rodent and the wrecked car and the very disgusting toilet are not rated very, very pleasantly. So the question is, who looks at what? And how often do people dwell on these things? Uh, there is another established finding here. Uh, people tend to look more at the negative than the positive. We're just kind of like that as human beings. So they're more likely to focus on a, a, a menacing knife than a floppy-eared bunny. But the question is, as you can imagine, what, what about liberals and conservatives? Where does this go? Well, uh, in this particular case, I, I didn't show a continuous result. It's kind of nice just to see the bars. So I just divided them in half. So at, at the median, I have liberals on one side, conservatives on the other. What the bar indicates is the tendency to look longer at the negative images. So you can see that liberals still look longer at the negative images than the positive images, but not by a lot, so 400 milliseconds. And then you look over at conservatives, and uh, they look longer at the negative than the positive by uh, 1,600 milliseconds, a difference of 1,200 milliseconds. Which, uh, we worked on this with an eye tracking specialist, a guy named Mike Dodd. Uh, back in Nebraska, and, and he says that in his world, this is an eternity, which made us feel really good. So, uh, it, it is the case, though, that consistently conservatives are spending more time, paying more attention to those, those negative images than the positive images. Here's another one you can play along with a little bit, although you'll think I'm uh, offending your intelligence because this is kind of a child's game, but bear with me and I'll explain what's going on in just a second. On the next slide, you're going to see a picture of an animal, and I'd just like you to tell me if that is a zoo animal or a farm animal. And then after a couple of these, I'll tell you what's going on. So, what about that? Good. Here's another one. All right. One more. 
Wild. <laughs> 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 you're a great audience. That's exactly what you're supposed to do. It turns out that we're not really interested in your ability to identify a pig as a farm animal and uh, a zebra as a zoo animal. We're interested in these ambiguous situations, uh, such as this one, a bison. So, um, you know, I'll bet there are bison around here on farms. Uh, we have them in Nebraska. Ted Turner uh, has a big ranch with lots of bison. But of course, we probably most of us have seen these in zoos as well. So, you notice the question mark in the center there. There are varieties of ways of setting up this design, but the basic pitch is that you uh, uh, you can make it so that people, if they ask for a special dispensation, they can put it in a middle category or in both, but you have to kind of go outside of the framework of the design to do that. So what we're really interested in is who says, don't make me do this, I can't put it in one category or the other. These are individuals known as soft categorizers, whereas other people, they don't, they'll go right ahead and they'll say, they'll just give it their best shot. Say, you know, that's, that's a farm animal, damn it. You know, it's just, uh, and they're known as, uh, as hard categorizers. So what about liberals and conservatives? How did they break down? Uh, you, uh, you could probably come to this answer uh, on your own. Think about who's going to forge ahead and put, uh, put the animals in, uh, in one of the two categories. Who's going to uh, kind of equivocate and ask for special permission? Well, conservatives consistently do uh, behave as hard categorizers, liberals as soft categorizers. Not to be sure, we haven't done this with Donald Trump and Barack Obama, <laughs> but I'm pretty comfortable it would work out. I mean, Donald Trump is kind of the quintessential hard categorizer. People are, you know, beautiful or they're ugly or they're smart or they're stupid. It's a pretty, pretty dichotomous world where I suspect that might not be the case for, for Barack Obama. So here's another, I think, fairly consistent and, and relevant uh, difference between liberals and conservatives. We've taken this to the next level and looked at not just these psychological tests, but physio physiological tests. And the one that, that we use the most often is called electrodermal activity, or some people refer to it as skin conductance. And what happens there is you, you provide them with a stimulus. Uh, and as you can see, there is a lot of bouncing around. There's a lot of spontaneous activity with skin conductance. Uh, if you think that's a lot, you should see what happens with brain imaging. Uh, but you can also see that there is a, a jump up there uh, as a result of the stimulus. And you can measure that, and, and that's what we do. So if I, you know, uh, right now, if, if a loved one of yours walked into this room, you would have a sympathetic nervous response. You'd have a physiological response. Uh, or if a bear walked in this room, you would have another <laughs> physiological response. It's usually larger with the negative uh, uh, than it is with the positive, uh, as we've kind of seen throughout this talk. Uh, but the question is, uh, might that difference between positive and negative change for uh, some people, particularly liberals and conservatives? So we showed individuals one picture at a time. Uh, rather than a collage, so something like this. Uh, this, by the way, in that, those IAPS images I mentioned, this was one of the highest rated images. People seem to like this. Uh, I think it's a lady going down the ski slope, uh, kind of bracing conditions. That's, that's a very favorable thing. Whereas a wrecked car uh, is not a favorable thing. So we're trying to see how people respond to that. Do liberals and conservatives respond differently? That's known as the negativity bias. And here's the result. Uh, the journal we sent this to actually wanted us to use the words aversive and appetitive rather than positive or negative. So aversive is like the wrecked car head of the, uh, the lady enjoying herself on the ski slope. And the blue line indicates that for liberals, there really isn't much difference. Liberals respond about as much physiologically to the, the exciting and pleasant image as they do to the negative image. But look at the conservatives. There we see a significantly higher physiological response to the negative images. And again, there were dozens of these that we do. It wasn't just the ones I, I showed you. Then they do the appetitive uh, image. So it seems as though it's not just psychologically, but also physiologically. Uh, there is a difference between liberals and conservatives in terms of a, a kind of a sensitivity to the negative. Uh, I mentioned neuroimaging before, so we, we did that as well. We're kind of pleased with ourselves that we had a, a, a design that allowed us to have over 100 people in the brain scanner. This is, it used to be that brain imaging, if you had a dozen people, this was a good thing. It was a very expensive uh, thing to use. Um, but we, we had over 100, so that should give us a little bit more, uh, more reliability. Um, and we showed them a variety of images, that's kind of our thing, show them these images, the positive or negative, and see how people respond. We focused mostly here on mutilation images. I'm going to show you uh, one of the milder mutilation images we showed, but again, it is a little bit of an uh, uh, uncomfortable image. Uh, here's the mutilation image, just a guy with uh, an open wound on, on his arm. So we wanted to see how people would respond to that, and if liberals and conservatives respond differently. The answer is that they do. Uh, we could make surprisingly accurate predictions about who is a liberal, who is a conservative, just by looking at their brain activation patterns while they viewed those mutilation images. We didn't need to know anything about them uh, other than that, whether they're male, female, old, young. In fact, we did this. We'd give the results to a uh, so-called naive uh, researcher. We'd say, tell us who this is, uh, and whether it's a liberal or conservative, and they could do that simply by looking um, at, the, at those results. What was different, you might 
you might wonder. Uh, I don't think we want to get too much into the weeds on this, uh, but I'll just mention a couple of the areas that, that stood out. On the left, uh, the little part of the brain there that, that's uh, colored in yellowish orange is uh, the part of the brain where conservatives had greater activation than liberals. That's known as the anterior cingulate cortex, which to grossly oversimplify is kind of a part of the brain that engages in some triage, and lets the prefrontal cortex, which is this part of the brain where some of the higher order of thinking goes on, lets it know that something kind of unexpected has happened here. We can't just rely on our standard operating procedure. We've got to figure out something different. So that, that uh, mutilation image was not expected in a way, and we have, to, we have to go outside our norm to figure out what to do. As far as the liberals, uh, on the right, you see where they had greater activation than the conservatives. Major area there is something known as the somatosensory 2, which is a part of the brain that is active in pain. So if I go up and, and kick Matt in the shin right now, he'd have a, an S2 uh, response. But he'd also have a response if I showed him a picture of a person, or maybe a video, of a person stepping on a rusty nail with a nail going right through the person's mm -hmm. foot. You got the somatosensory 2 is, is not just pain, but also kind of an empathic uh, response. And there we see a greater, uh, a greater activation pattern among liberals than, than conservatives. The most important thing is that we can tell what uh, political ideology you tend to have simply on the basis of how <coughs> it reacts to those non-political images. So let's review. Um, we found that conservatives are more likely than liberals to spot negative images, to attend to negative events uh, in the eye tracker, to remember them better uh, in the memory paradigm, to categorize them uh, more clearly and definitively, uh, to have a heightened physiological response and a very distinctive neural pattern as well. Well, um, well, well and good, but uh, we've got a lot of criticism uh, from uh, many uh, points of view. But the most common one, I think, is that uh, we paint with too broad a brush. And in other words, this notion of just liberals and conservatives, that covers a lot of ground. And uh, we probably want to refine that more. Um, you know, if you, you think of what's going on in politics right now, uh, this is a little bit dated because some of these people have already dropped out, but we know there are a lot of different kinds of liberals seeking the nomination. Uh, in 2020, the people who support Joe Biden are not the same as the people who support Elizabeth Warren, and certainly not the same as the people who support Marianne Williamson. So we've got a lot of a lot of interesting variety there. And just to lump these all together as liberals is probably doing a disservice to things. And certainly on the conservative side, think of this: we got the what I think we could refer to as a nativist wing of the, the Republican Party with Donald Trump. Uh, the more socially oriented uh, conservatives like Ted Cruz more traditional business and economic conservatives like Jeb Bush and libertarians like Rand Paul. Uh, so, and I'm sure you could think of more varieties, but that, that's at least an indication that, that by putting these all together, we are probably not getting an accurate view. So I, I think this is true. I, I took this to heart, and that's part of the reason that my current research looks at a specific type of individual, a specific type of conservative. Not conservatives generally, but I am interested in strong Trump supporters. Not just people who voted for Trump. You know, 63 million Americans voted for Donald Trump in 2016. But I want, uh, I want this young lady down here in the pink top, <laughs> the one who's just going nuts. She can hardly contain herself. That, uh, uh, Donald Trump is right in front of her. I want the really ardent Trump supporters. So that's what I'm after. I'd like to understand them. I think the Trump base is really an important part of American politics. More than that, you know, I think we, we don't have to uh, pay all that much attention to politics around the world to know that this is a fairly common phenotype. Yeah. These, there, people who support Donald Trump uh, have been fond of other leaders around the world as well. Yeah. Uh, you probably know all these people, Boris Johnson on the upper left and rotating around clockwise, uh, Marine Le Pen on the top right of France, of the People's Party, Viktor Orban of Hungary, uh, certainly cut from a very similar cloth. Rodrigo Duterte on the lower right, uh, yeah. the Philippines, uh, you know, going after drug dealers and all kinds of people. Uh, I think Netanyahu increasingly belongs in this uh, in this gallery as well. And then right above him is uh, Jair uh, Bolsonaro of, of Brazil. So, and we could go on. I could have several screens like this, as, as you know, uh, of, of individuals who have these same kinds of orientations and followers who, who love the individuals who have those orientations. So I think we need to understand this if we're going to understand politics today. So. Uh, the main uh, database that I'm using is a fairly large survey that I was able to do of a uh, random sample of Americans. This was done in April, so it was about six months ago, <coughs> so pretty recent. I didn't want it to be in the election, either the 2016 election or the 2020 election. I wanted just to kind of understand, without comparing Trump to anybody else, do you like this guy, and, and how much do you like this guy, after you've seen him in operation for a while. So this was you know, two years into his presidency. So people should have had a pretty good flavor of what he's like. And uh, one of the main questions I used in this survey 
uh, was this, or main item. It said, uh, Donald Trump is one of the very best presidents in the entire history of our country. So think about how you would answer that question. You could go from strongly agree to agree to neither disagree nor agree to uh, disagree to strongly disagree. Whatever. Um, if you want to know the results of that, 49% uh, strongly disagree. So a big chunk of the population said that that is a laughable proposition. You know, I might like Donald Trump, but I certainly don't think he's right up there with George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, Franklin Roosevelt. Um, and then it spreads out a little bit more after that. 7% just disagreed, 50% in the middle, 12% agreed, and strongly percent, 17% strongly agreed with that. And those are the ones I'm really interested in. I call them Trump venerators. So that 17%. That says they think not only do they support Donald Trump or approve of him, they think he's one of the very best presidents in the history of our country. And they say, I strongly agree with that, not just that I, I agree with that. So I want to know, um, I, I want to focus on them. This is tricky, by the way. Uh, I, I needed to do something like that because a surprising number of Republicans and conservatives do support Donald Trump. You know, there aren't that many who don't. So you kind of need to ratchet it up a little bit. Uh, and, and that's why I, I went with this, you know, one of the best ever. I know it's a delicate topic. I don't know the political persuasion of people in this room, but I do know that, that uh, people feel strongly about this. And my goal is not to you know, denigrate Trump venerators uh, or to kind of engage in some false equivalency, but I'd like to understand them. I think it's really important. You know, if, if we disagree with them, we need to understand. We need to disagree with them on the right reasons. We need to make sure we know why they think the way they do. Because I think the standard narrative about these strong Trump supporters is really incorrect. And I'll give you a little bit of flavor for that in, in a second. Um, all right, so uh, the popular wisdom on, on these strong Trump venerators is, uh, as far as demographic concern, they're white, male, elderly, uh, less educated, and have low incomes. But then there are a lot of, of more uh, uh, emotional and, and psychological traits as well. These have all been linked to them on multiple occasions in the literature that Trump supporters are fearful, angry, anxious, bitter, resentful, submissive, authoritarian, it's really probably the most popular, uh, conformist, and racist. So I wanted to look at that. As far as the demographics are concerned, most of those are, are true, uh, although it's easy to, easy to overestimate. Uh, they certainly are, are, are heavily white. Um, they are a little bit male, but not as much as you'd think. You know, 52% of white females voted for Donald Trump in 2016. And as far as Trump venerators are concerned, I'm picking up a big chunk of them that are, are female. So more male than female, yes, but not by a lot. Uh, the one that's really wrong here, by the way, is income. As you might know, uh, Trump supporters actually are doing quite well. This notion that they're economically marginalized by globalization or whatever is simply not true. Um, uh, the, the average income for Trump venerators and Trump supporters generally is, is higher than the people who voted for Hillary Clinton. So that's the demographics. I really want to focus, though, on these more psychological things. I think that's where it gets interesting. And I think, I think we're uh, you know, singing the wrong song on a lot of these traits as well. Uh, <coughs> Without making this too much of a personal revelation, I think part of my interest in this topic is that I have family members who are very strong Trump supporters. I love my brother. I'd like to understand him a little better. Uh, so, you know, this, this is part of my motivation. Um, and, uh, you know, on the basis of my casual and anecdotal observation of some of my family members and others I know in Nebraska who are strong Trump supporters, this notion that they are, uh, let's say, authoritarian, that they just love, they need some strong authority figure to tell them what to do, that just never really rang true to me. That's certainly not true of my brother or his nephews. They are, I have a picture of the bikers for Trump, and I think there is a fairly strong flavor of this among Trump supporters, the kind of bad boy and bad girl, uh, rebellious type, which is the polar opposite of, of this notion that they're authoritarians, you know, please tell me how to live, live my life. And uh, the notion that they're, uh, you know, really bitter and unhappy people. You know, I don't always pick up that as, as well in uh, just day-to-day -day interaction. So I was curious to see what the, the more systematic analysis of this, uh, of this might show. Traditionalists, uh, you know, in my, in my family, certain, they're not traditional at all. They love to do things in a different sort of way and be outrageous. So here's a, kind of a quick run-through of some of the items that I thought might be relevant to these, uh, these standard narrative explanations. And uh, for the most part, there aren't a lot of differences, but if you note, if, to the extent there are differences, they almost run in the opposite direction of the standard narrative. So the first one, for example, I feel better about the treatment of people like me. It's actually liberals who are more likely than these Trump venerators to say that they agreed with that statement. Again, not by a lot, but it doesn't go in the direction that people expected. I like it when others make decisions for me. So this is the authoritarian thing. As you can see, most people say we don't like that. And people are not authoritarians. They like to make decisions themselves. Uh, but to the extent there is a difference, actually liberals are a little bit more likely to say, yes, I like it when others make decisions. <coughs> and these people who are Trump venerators, and remember how I'm defining those, people who said, I think he's one of the very best presidents ever. 
Um, I see myself as angry and frustrated. This is kind of a common personality item. Uh, to the extent there's a difference there, it's actually liberals who are more likely to say they're angry and frustrated than Trump venerators. Uh, I resent wealthy city dwellers who do not have to do real work. I don't know if any of you have come across the work by uh, Kathy Kramer, who does a really good book on um, Scott Walker in Wisconsin and the rural resentment, she calls it. So this item was kind of drawn from that. Well, look, uh, actually almost two to one, you see, um, you see people who uh, agree with that statement being liberals rather than, uh, rather than Trump venerators. Oh, sorry, and I skipped the socially unfulfilled one, which I think is kind of important. Uh, I see myself as socially unfulfilled and in need of better support. Again, actually liberals are much more likely to say that, two to one, uh, in fact, over oh, there's Trump venerators. And then I included the income that I talked about before. You see there that liberals are actually more likely to be under $50,000 annual income than, than Trump venerators. So I just don't think any of that is quite consistent with what the conventional wisdom says about uh, these, these strong Trump supporters. What about feeling threatened and being fearful? I don't think that really works either, but it's a little more complicated story. Here are some results on a particular set of items. Well, the, the first two shouldn't surprise you. The liberals are, uh, are feeling more threatened by income inequality and people's inability to get health care. That's what liberals are. Uh, uh, but the last four, I think, might be a little bit more surprising. They're not really political. Liberals are more likely to be threatened by clowns, uh, by death, by windstorms, and by vicious animals. So those, there we've kind of moved out of the political realm and moved into more general things. And, and it's, it's not conservatives or Trump supporters that are more likely to be fearful. There are some things, though, that Trump venerators say they are more threatened by than liberals. And those also, I think, are fairly predictable. Criminals, the so-called might of foreign countries, such as China, I think is the way we worded that. Terrorist attacks and immigrants. All those things get a higher level of, 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 of reported threat by conservatives, or, sorry, by Trump venerators than by, than by liberals. I think there's a, a little bit of an asterisk here, though, because even though Trump venerators say they're more threatened by immigrants, I'm not sure they need to be more threatened by immigrants in order to want immigrants to go away. And let me let me explain that. Um, so here, uh, uh, you thought you were going to get out of this with no political sciencey kind of stuff. But you were wrong. So uh, what we have here on the uh, x-axis is uh, what you think of immigrants. So there are two items here. Do you think immigrants commit more crimes than non-immigrants? And do you think immigrants make uh, America a better place? So if you said they don't commit more crimes, oh, there, don't commit more crimes and make America a better place, that's very positive. That's over there. And over here on the highly negative, then you say, yeah, they commit more crimes and they make America a worse place. So if we just look at liberals, and then on the y-axis, by the way, is do you think we should have um, uh, immigration? Should we reduce immigration? So it's not really surprising, is it, that those people who have a highly negative view of immigrants are more likely to say we should reduce immigration. Mm -hmm. So that kind of fits. But remember, this is just liberals who answer that way. Here it is for moderates, mm -hmm. and kind of the same story, but a little bit less steep. Here it is for those conservatives who are not Trump venerators. Remember, I went to special lengths to define that specifically, uh, so we'd have some conservatives who weren't like that. And then here I think it gets even more interesting. So these are the Trump venerators. Now yes, there's a little bit of slope to that line, but not a lot. And the, I've circled that, uh, that point on the upper left there, because think about that. These are individuals who say, yes, uh, immigrants make America a better place to live. They don't commit any crime. I want to reduce immigration. You know, so they don't need to have these negative views of immigrants to want them to go away. It's, it's a different mindset. Uh, and I think it's one in which they just think, you know, this is what we do. This is what America should be. It doesn't have to be built on these horribly negative images of them. They don't need that uh, in order to want immigration to be, to be reduced. Uh, this is the, same, the bottom one is the same one I just showed you, but I thought the top one I'd, I'd throw in as well. This is, uh, instead of your perception of immigrants, this is do you find them, uh, are you threatened by them? So there again, the uh, circle in red shows that uh, these are people that strongly disagree. I do not feel threatened by immigrants but they still agree that we should reduce the level of immigration. I think that's, that's uh, whereas you get over here, and you know, there's just not much difference when the people have a positive views of, of immigrants. There's a big difference across ideologies when they have negative views. All right, I know it's just about time to wrap up. Well, if, that's, if we know what's not going on, let's kind of figure out what is. And so let me, let me hit that before I close down shop here. So I don't think it's a standard narrative about you know, being threatened and, uh, and having these demographic traits. Here are the items where I really get a big difference between Trump venerators and liberals. <laughs> Things like this. The country's central goal should be strength. The worst thing for a country is to be perceived as weak. If we are not vigilant, we'll be victims. So there you see, you know, ranging from you know, uh, liberals saying maybe 18, 20, 30 percent uh, that they agree with that, whereas we're about 90 percent of Trump venerators say yes. So this notion of strength and, and deterrence is really important. Uh, the last item goes the opposite direction. Notice it's 
it's asking uh, about uh, outsiders as a threat. Well, um, there we see that it's um, uh, liberals by 81% uh, who say the biggest threat is not outsiders, but a concentration of power, whereas uh, conservatives are, are less likely to agree with that. And an interesting thing, I'm not showing it here, but if we compare Trump venerators to those conservatives who don't venerate Trump, we'd still get a big difference. Uh, so this seems to be something very peculiar about Trump. I mean, conservatives are still pretty high on this, but Trump venerators take it to a different level in terms of this idea of personal strength uh, and, and the need to be vigilant. I saw that when I asked about what issues are really important to you. Uh, I think I had 20 issues that they could pick from. Here are the, one, the, the top four in order for the liberals. <laughs> Racial justice, health care, women's rights, income inequality. You think that list might be just a little bit different for Trump venerators? Yeah. Immigration, national defense, gun rights, law and order. So I think what's, you know, what's really, the way I interpret this, I see a big difference between your view of insiders and outsiders. Some people use the term in-groups and out-groups. I don't quite like that because I think it's a little bit broader. We can talk about that later if you want. But the notion that um, you know, uh, uh, racial minorities, uh, people who are struggling, maybe don't have health care, women, a historically oppressed group, uh, those are the kinds of outsiders that uh, liberals are reaching out to and want to embrace. Trump venerators, they want to build a wall. They want to keep these people at arm's length, whether they be immigrants, you know, building a strong defense, uh, having gun rights so they can be protected, and strong law and order to keep the, the criminals at bay. So I think this, this to me is the real difference between Trump venerators and other people. I call them securitarians. Uh, I don't know if this word will catch on, it's kind of a mouthful, but uh, psychologically there's a, a very famous book called The Authoritarian Personality, so I think, uh, I think that's not quite true, as you can tell from my comments earlier about authority. I think what they really want is, is security. If there are strong authority figures who aren't providing security, they don't like them. Uh, or if there are these traditional uh, norms of society that don't emphasize security, they don't like them. I mean, think of the Bible. Jesus says, Turn the other, turn the other cheek, and uh, Trump venerators don't like that at all. They like eye for an eye. They go back to the Old Testament. So it's not a question of one being legitimate. You can't get much more legitimate than Jesus Christ you know, in, in the eyes of most Trump venerators, but yet they reject that. So that's, and I think it's security. We've got to go beyond this notion of authority, which is why I use this phrase called securitarians. And I, I mentioned here, if I had the task of figuring out your political beliefs, uh, and, and I could only ask one question and anywhere in the world, the one I'd ask is, which is a bigger threat to our country, outsiders or insiders? I think that's really the, you know, stripping it all down, that's the core differential among, among people. Uh, and I have a picture of, of Elizabeth Warren here because I was really struck, I don't know if you heard her speech in, in New York, uh, what, a month ago, uh, and it, I came away from that realizing that she was about as negative toward insiders, especially corporations, uh, as uh, Donald Trump is toward outsiders. So mm -hmm. I, I think there you see the kind of classic confrontation. Who, who's the threat here? And I think this goes clear back to our evolutionary past, where we had, you know, the biggest threats to humans have always been other humans. But the question is, are they the humans in the tribe over the hill? Uh, or are they the humans who are going to get too much power in your own group? The, the big man, as it was men back then. Big man behavior was something that they were very concerned about. So I, I think we still see the echoes of that today. Who are you really concerned about, the outsiders or the insiders? So let me wrap this up in a kind of unusual way. This is an old field mouse. This is a deer mouse. Can you tell the difference? I, I can't, but I'm not a specialist in this. Uh, well, they're, they're interesting because they, they all dig burrows, whether they're old field mice or deer mice. But they don't dig the same kind of burrow. The old field mouse digs a burrow with an escape tunnel. So I, you can see it coming up there uh, just a couple of inches from the surface. So if a snake uh, appears in the entrance, they can go up there, a couple of quick uh, paws, and, and boom, they're out, and they can run away. The deer mice never build an escape route on their tunnels. These are fairly similar species. They can interbreed. They're so physically similar. But um, the one always builds an escape tunnel, and the one doesn't. Was a psychologist in, at Harvard named Hopi Hoekstra, who's really done some fascinating work. She's uh, uh, had these two different species uh, interbreed. And uh, what do you think happens to the offspring? Do you think they build escape tunnels or not? Uh, every single one of them builds an escape tunnel. So that's kind of interesting. So it suggests there could be a genetic element to this. We don't know for sure. But, and, and if there is, it looks like there might not be a lot of genes, because if there were a lot of genes, you could have different combinations. But the fact that every single one builds an escape tunnel is, is really kind of suggestive. So what she did next was she had the, these uh, uh, offspring that had been interbred. Uh, she bred them back to the deer mice. She was trying to get some variation here, and she did. In that next generation, she had some that built escape tunnels and some that didn't. Mm. And now she's looking at the genetics of that to try to figure out which part of the genome uh, might, be, uh, might be relevant. Um, 
I was interested in something different. I contacted her and she was very, uh, very helpful. My interest was whether or not the ones that built the escape tunnels behaved differently otherwise than the ones that didn't. You can probably see where I'm going with this. And she said, well, yeah, it's the damnedest thing. They, uh, it turns out the ones that build the escape tunnels seem to be uh, happier and better adjusted. Uh, you can do this with mice. They're open field tests and see how they behave when they're in uh, a well-lighted place because mice usually don't like that. Uh, and I said, I love you. And, and she said, well, my research on mice usually doesn't inspire that kind of reaction. Um, and I, then I explained that actually this is kind of my, my notion that uh, the, the desire to be safe and to take these protective measures does not need to be based on fear. It's more that this is just what we do. This is a, a, an obligation. And if you fulfill that obligation, you can sometimes feel pretty good. There's a very puzzling finding, uh, at least puzzling to a lot of people, conservatives consistently are happier than liberals. Social well-being, any measure you want. Uh, and people have said, why is this? And I think this helps me at least understand it a little bit, because I don't think, um, you know, obviously we're not talking about, you know, uh, building escape tunnels. Humans don't do that, but we can build walls, and we can have policies that uh, defend the castle and that allow us to bear arms. And we might be doing these things not because we're just extraordinarily fearful, but because we think this is just what one does. Protecting yourself and your family is a responsibility. That's the way securitarians view the world. And it strikes a lot of other people, I call them Unitarians, it's a, a religion, but it's still I think it's kind of descriptive of what we're talking about. It strikes them as, as just completely bizarre uh, that you'd want to do these things, but it makes perfect sense to them. So, um, uh, old field mice do not build escape tunnels because they're neurotic or convinced their burrows will be uh, invaded. Um, they build them because that is what old field mice do, and I think we see the same kind of thing in, in humans. They don't build escape tunnels, uh, but they, they support border walls, they support things like that, not because they're innately fearful. Uh, they just think that's that's the right thing to do, and they think that people who don't support this are just crazy. They, why why would you leave yourself vulnerable? So I know, I think as uh, I'm by myself, I'm not a Trump venerator. I'll you know, come clean on that. Uh, I think we need to work hard at understanding that they have a different orientation, and that's mm -hmm. that's where they're coming from. So um, th there's a problem, of course. So it's not so much for mice because an old field mouse doesn't really care if a deer mouse builds an escape tunnel or not. But we're in a collective society, and, and the policies that we put forward are going to impinge upon the other. Um, so uh, you know, we've got to figure this out. Uh, securitarians make it more difficult for so-called Unitarians to embrace outsiders. And that's, that's a problem. That bothers us. Unitarians make it difficult for Securitarians to protect themselves. And that's a problem. And, and uh, so they go after it. Um, you know, Securitarians are about as threatened by liberals as they are by immigrants. 74 to 75. So, you know, this is a danger. This is a threat. And it, it works the other way as well. Can we structure a society in which these opposing needs are met? I don't know. This is my last slide. It won't be easy. Uh, yeah, I always feel this is the, the weakest part of the talk, right? But if we had solutions, we'd be somewhere else. Um, I do think a few things we can do. I mean, I, I hope it might help to recognize uh, what the real point of disagreement is. I think we get it wrong a lot of times when we don't understand uh, each other. That I think this defending against so-called outsiders is a big factor. Uh, understanding our opponents that will help us understand ourselves. I think name calling doesn't do any good. You know, you can you can call uh, Trump supporters racist, and they can call uh, their their opponents uh, naive and traitors, and it's not doing good. So I think we need to get by that. Um, you know, dialogue is is nice, but I think we also need to get by that in a way because we're probably not going to convince the the ardent supporters on the other side. I think what we do need to do is compromise. Not compromise because we think the other side is half right, just because they're not going away. Uh, and and uh, it's probably the only way we're gonna, we're gonna uh, you know, make any progress in the political system right now. And I think Tom Foley will be back. Thank you very much. So we have about 10 minutes for Q&A. Okay, I'm trying. So you were saying that the, um, conservatives more than liberals um, show activity in their interior single cortex, like with regards to the mutilation images. Yeah. Do you think that, um, and you said that's kind of connected with like triage, do you think that that has to do with like them trying to solve the problem instead of becoming emotional about it? Yeah, that's a good way to put it. You, you could. Um, you know, again, the, the prefrontal cortex right above our eyes. This is part of the brain where you're really gonna gonna make higher order decisions. So, and, but I always like to think of it as lazy. It really doesn't want to get involved. It, it would like to go through life 
you know, without prefrontal cortex calling into action. So it's the ACC that, that does that. And so, yeah, I suppose you could think about that. It's, think about it that way, it's saying, um, you know, help us figure out what to do in this situation. We're not going to just go along like, like we have in the past. Yeah. It's good. Yes. Oh. Yep. So if being a conservative or a liberal is this innate biological um, or innate and caused by like biology, then how do you explain for people who start off as liberal and then as they get older start to become like, more conservative? Good. No, good question. A couple of points on that. Um, first of all, the amount of change is not as great as you might think. I mean, we, we all kind of focus on a few people who might have done a political 180, but we just had a graduate student, in fact, who did a, a paper on that, uh, his dissertation. Uh, and it's surprising, after the age of 25, how little change there is in political beliefs. It happens, but it's not very common. So this notion, you know, that, uh, what's the saying, when you, if you're not a, a liberal when you're 20, you don't have a heart. If you're not a conservative when you're 30, you don't have a brain. It implies that everybody drifts to the right. Uh, it's really not true. Most people stay the same. It is true, however, if they change, they are more likely to change to the right than the left. But the, the number of people who change is, is really fairly small. So I, I wouldn't emphasize that, uh, you know, the degree of change too much. The other thing I wanted to say uh, with regard to that question is that, remember, uh, biology is not just genetics. It's important to that, that you can have something that gets biologically instantiated even if you weren't born that way. You know, it might be a searing event. I mean, some things that happen to us politically, we kind of, you know, we recognize them and move on. They don't really leave a excuse me, a deep impact, but other things could actually affect how we respond. We might have a physiological response to a picture of Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton, uh, but that has to be trained. So uh, keep that in mind. We, it doesn't have to be. I, I think genetics play a role in politics. That's a controversial thing to say. Uh, if you believe twin studies, it might be about a third of our political beliefs that can be shaped by genetics. But keep that in context that a lot of political scientists flipped off uh, you know, uh, off the deep end when they uh, when they heard that and still don't believe it. But it does mean two thirds are from the environment. So it's not like that's not like nothing's there. But the environment can affect you biologically. Is I guess what I'm what I'm trying to say. Yes, uh, standing up. You had a oh, she actually asked me. Oh, okay. Yeah, in the back. Is there a significant difference in uh, your original uh, demonstration of how strongly people react to negative impulses? Uh, is there a stronger impulse than that if they've been primed to think about their uh, political views and have to think about their political views? That's a good question. We were fortunate in that our uh, assessment of their political views came a couple of months before we did the study. So at least we don't think there's any, uh, you know, uh, pollution uh, that we prime them with that. But your question is a little bit different, uh, uh, and I don't know the answer to that. I think that would be, we didn't do a lot of, of uh, priming. Uh, but that would be a good way to show the interaction of these environmental things with the uh, differences. Yeah. Did lifestyle uh, factor much into, uh, like, uh, I'm just thinking that certain jobs, like police officers or military personnel, would probably give you some similar results if you studied them, regardless of their political ideology? Yeah, we didn't have a large enough end to do that. And people have said things like, uh, I guess I didn't talk much about it today, but we've done some special research on disgust. Uh, which is nice because you can really evoke disgust in a lab. You really can't evoke threat. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the IRB won't let us do that. <laughs> <laughs> and quite rightfully so. We, we can't let a bear into the room. Uh, but you show a people a picture of a really nasty toilet and, and you can, can get them disgusted. Anyway, we've got a lot of people saying, well, what about uh, mothers especially or parents generally who have had to change lots of diapers, you know, this, or nurses, uh, uh, people who deal with these things. Certainly those kinds of things could affect it. Although I'm not, sometimes I'm not sure which direction that would go if they just become a nerd. Uh, or if that would make them especially sensitive. But that's a really good question. We need a lot bigger end, though, to, you know, to be able to break it down by occupational category. Yeah. I think your differences are fascinating, but I wonder if there really are, in terms of conservative and liberal, really describe them. Uh, yeah. If you could bring this survey back to the 1930s and study people's response to Huey Long in, in Louisiana, he was a leftist, yeah. arguably, a, arguably a liberal in, in, in one sense, uh, authoritarian. Do you think people respond to Huey Long about the same way they re respond to Donald Trump? And is that really conservatism versus liberalism? Well, there again, you know, increasingly I, I feel comfortable more with this securitarian, unitarian kind of thing. If the focus is on insider or outsider, and I think you would pick up some of that with the, the populace of the past, you know, very negative toward, uh, toward outsiders. So I think that, that part of it is kind of universal. Yeah. Um, can't run the clock back and do the studies with, uh, with them, but... Um, 
I just had somebody read my manuscript, and she was very concerned that um, she, she said, well, why isn't Trump like Hitler? And I really don't think they are. I think that's where an important difference. I mean, Hitler wanted to take over the world, and he wanted to kill all outsiders or a good chunk of them. I think a lot of the Trump venerators, you know, instead of panzer tanks, their symbol is really a wall. You know, they, like, they're much less invasive. So I think you might get some variation along those lines, but I still think that... Uh, that uh, impulse to, to keep outsiders, to view them as different and keep them away, uh, would be maybe fairly universal. That's, that's my argument anyway. Yeah. Is there, are you doing any of this in terms of cross-cultural, anyone else in other cultures doing this kind of work that corresponds? And it strikes me that it's very narrow in terms of this historical perspective. Obviously, you're doing experiments. But the first question seems to me fairly crucial to uh, uh, is that you're giving us a kind of social determinism in reference to this particular culture? Does this, do, do these work, things work in other nations, other well, academic traditions? No, I disagree with you on the historically narrow thing. I mean, I think this, I think this is going to work. Uh, but that's an easy thing to say because we can't test it. But you know, I think, I think this argument about unitarians versus securitarians is a, a better fit than these more. You know, a lot of people focus on ideology as some kind of economic thing, and I think it's, that wasn't a big deal to hunter-gatherer societies. They didn't have much economy to go around. As far as your, the thrust, main thrust of your question, though, uh, there's been some work done in other countries. It, it works pretty well in Italy. Uh, in, in India, again, this is just like one of the paradigms as opposed to all of them. Uh, people who have more uh, conservative social beliefs in India are uh, doing the same kinds of psychological patterns that we see here. The one thing that's not holding up well uh, in replication is the physiological research. You know, it's just turned, I've just kind of been finding out about that lately. Um, I'm a little bit less concerned with that now that I do this stuff on Trump. If, if I'm emphasizing really not the, the emotional negative reaction so much as just saying this is my duty, I'm focusing on the fact that they pay attention to these negative things in their environment as opposed to have a, some physiological threat. So I think the, uh, you're absolutely right to raise this question. There hasn't been as much as we'd like in other countries. There has been some. It usually works. It doesn't work on the physiology. I guess that's about all I can say, I say right now. Uh, Denmark, Italy, India, you get some support. Yeah. I was wondering, like, if you only looked at, quote unquote, venerators across presidents. Like, is there something that's unique about yeah. Trump venerators that's different than whatever you would call an Obama venerator? Or yeah. Venerator, right? <laughs> is, are venerators just venerators regardless of who the president is, right? Yeah. As opposed course. to the rest of their party. Yeah. No, I wondered that too. Uh, actually, as a part of my research, I went to some Trump rallies. And um, it, then that question came to my mind. And so I had this, you know, they're very happy there. But is that just because they're surrounded by people who agree with them? Mm -hmm. uh, and would I see the same thing at a, a rally for Bernie Sanders in 2016 or, or some other Democratic candidate? I, I don't know. That would, that's a good question. Uh, yeah. Um, do you think the securitarian behavior exhibited by these venerators is uh, learned and reinforced by surrounding themselves with other supporters? Uh, similar to how like a baby field mouse would learn to uh, yeah. dig a burrow versus not dig a burrow while watching its like you know parents, I assume, if they den together. Or is it uh, something that you think is just more like kind of sporadic? And does that explain the behavior that you see in the study? Let me go on a tangent first. Mm -hmm. uh, it turns out with the mice, there's no learned behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, in fact, uh, Hoekstra has kept them in, in the lab for a long time, and then, so they can't build a, a burrow. And then she lets them out, uh, and they immediately do whatever their species does without seeing anybody else do it. So this, you know, again, this, this seems uh, deeper. But now that I mentioned the tangent, I, that was the main, that doesn't matter. Do you think the behavior is uh, learned and reinforced yeah. by surrounding people with similar ideologies? Or similar yeah, ideas? you know, I'll go back to that, the, the, the genetic results, which I, I think are probably true. I, I can see about a third of it being genetic. I, I think there is a genetic component, so you know, you, you're free to disagree with me on that. Uh, but remember, that means that most of it is not genetic. And you know, some fascinating stuff on reading that shows there is a genetic basis for who's a good reader and who isn't, but it's not real strong. But what can happen is, uh, Christopher Jenks has some nice stuff on this, that you know, if you're a, a little bit of a good reader, then your parents reward you, and you're going to read more books, you're going to get reinforced for that, your, your teachers do, and so you know, it doesn't take much. Whereas you know, if, you're, if you're struggling to read, you're not going to do it. So then I think that environment can really kick in, which I think maybe is consistent with what, what you're suggesting. In the corner. Um, other political scientists have made a distinction between collectivists and, and individualists. 
how is the securitarian unitarian uh, difference yeah. different than the difference described there? Well, I guess I, you know, I don't think being a collectivist or an individualist would necessarily imply either a focus or not a focus on security. Um, in that regard, I think the, the Trump generators are interesting. Uh, you know, I think they're less fascist than isolationist. If you, if you kind of think about the extreme as maybe being revealing of, of what these people are like, um, you know, at root, I, I had a question there, something like, if you had to choose between a strong military or the right to bear arms, which would you pick? And these securitarians all go with the right to bear arms. Mm -hmm. So, you know, defense spending is great, but that really means I have to trust the defense establishment to do these things. And there might be some situations when I just can't do that, and I'd rather go curl up in my bunker with, you know, Harry uh, and have have stockpiles of weapons and things like that. Again, that's obviously an extreme, but I think I think there is a, a lack of trust in just about anything, um, and which maybe drives it a little bit toward the, the individual side of, of the ledger. John, we probably have time for one more okay. question. Right, okay. So you noted multiple physiological differences in conservatives and liberals, notably conservatives noticing you know, negative images more than yeah. a liberal would, or the ability to remember it better. Yeah. Um, within that study, is it just, is there a negative connotation to being different, or is different just different? Uh, you lost me at the very end. So, so is, is the ability to remember negative things better yeah, okay. inherently bad, or is it just different than? Right, well, that's, that's a good one to close on, actually. Um, I'm having to broaden it out a little bit. Um, you know, this, uh, you know, a kind of aversion to outsiders and, and attention to threats in the environment, I don't think we should view that as automatically bad. Biologists have a term, in fact, for organisms that are insufficiently sensitive to threats in their environment. Uh, Word is dead. <laughs> so, you know, uh, there's that. But then obviously you can take it too far the other way, right? If, if you're so focused on these threats that you don't trust anybody, you, you're not going to learn new ways of doing things, you're not going to trade and, and take advantage of what other people can do well. So I think that's, that's the real trick, is to get some kind of balance where we're not paralyzed by this, but yet we're obviously taking reasonable precautions so yeah, thanks for giving me the opportunity to say I, I don't think we should impute uh, too many value uh, judgments to this, uh, except maybe uh, at the extremes where it gets to be a problem. Okay, so you can see why I was thrilled that we could get John to come uh, to campus and do uh, his research. Before I ask you joining me and, and thanking him, let me remind you we have two events next Thursday at noon uh, about climate change and at 4.30 about the, about the impeachment process. If any of you happen to be here for a class, I'm not sure anyone is, There'll be sign-up sheets out in the lobby. Join me now thanking uh, John Hibbs.